wanted to talk about endovascular resuscitation in the Boas staff. That was kind of what was next on the agenda. But with the uh, early cessation of the UK Boa trial, I thought it might be prudent to wait for the outcome of that before we move on. Um, future sessions are going to be focusing more on uh, kind of trauma mimics and some other peripheral trauma related conditions. So we're kind of getting to the end of the core trauma stuff at the moment. So I put this photo in there because this is kind of, you know, what I'd like to think of the future of what our trauma care is going to look like here at NUH as one of the busiest major trauma centres in the country. This is a beautiful uh, hybrid resuscitation suite somewhere in America. Um, uh, this is obviously not what we've got at the moment, but, you know, envisage someday having this on the back end of one of our newly built resource departments. We've got interventional radiology, surgical capability um, and close proximity to ED. The purposes of today's talk, looking at damage control resuscitation, is really just to cover three areas. We're going to briefly look at hemostatic resuscitation again. Now, I've spoken about this previously, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on that topic. Uh, the second component of DCR is permissive hypotension. And what I really want to focus on is uh, a recent editorial by um, Matthew Wiles and Anesthesia, um, I'll say recent, it's a few years ago now, um, looking at the evidence um, for, or rather um, perhaps against the principle permissive hypotension for all cause major trauma. Um, it's a bit controversial, so I'm really happy for a bit of a debate and discussion at the end. And then finally, we're going to finish off talking about the damage controlled surgery component of DCR uh, and what we've done um, at NUH to try and uh, help with that, um, and specifically with regard to the new anaesthetic charts. So just to start off with the hemostatic uh, component, this is all old news. Um, everyone will be really familiar with this, so just forgive me for going through this briefly. Um, we're not giving crystalloid. We're talking about blood and blood products. And I'm going to talk in a few moments about um, some new trials that are about to launch pre-hospital looking at whole bloods, because that will um, we will be receiving patients who are having that in the near future. Um, CRASH trials are internationally accepted as being um, standard practice now, so we're given TXA to everybody. Um, I should say, though, that the eight hour infusion might be going. Um, there's work, there's recent stuff coming out, um, which we're looking at alternative strategies for that. So the second gram might be given as a bolus in, in the near future. And then finally, goal directed therapy. So many of you will be familiar with the recent ITATIC trial and the use of TEG and ROTEM in major trauma. Um, there's mixed uh, feelings about that. Um, certainly in my practice, I think it's very valuable in identifying patients with trauma-induced coagulopathy um, and therefore allowing us to manage their, their um, blood product resuscitation accordingly. Which brings me nicely on to traumatic coagulopathy. The concept of traumatic coagulopathy or acute coagulopathy of trauma can be a bit confusing because there's lots of um, overlapping terminology, but there's two main components to this based on our current understanding. Um, the first is one of trauma-induced coagulopathy. So that's the coagulopathy that happens for a major trauma patient before we've even seen them or done anything to them. And then resuscitation-induced coagulopathy is kind of where we get involved and how we can make things better or worse. So starting off with the trauma aspects, the tissue injury itself um, exposes tissue fracture and also unregulated thrombomodulin exposure um, and upregulation, um, which drives some coagulopathy. The shock state as well, resulting in that microcirculatory hypoperfusion drives some coagulopathy. I think that's really important when we come to talk about the principles of permissive hypotension, just, just keep that in the back of your mind. And there's a lot of work going on at the moment looking at um, something called endotheliopathy, so kind of pathophysiological processes of the endothelium um, and how they're involved in um, traumatic uh, induced coagulopathy. And you can see from this diagram there's loads of uh, kind of microcellular um, potential targets, I guess, with future interventions, but certainly areas of research at the moment. But it's not as straightforward as all of that. There's lots of other things which influence the um, coagulation of our major trauma patients. Um, the thing that's probably that's most relevant to us as anaesthetists is going to be the resuscitation factor component. So what 
volume resuscitation we're using. So, you know, we've moved away from crystal load resuscitation in the bleeding trauma patients. So a balanced resuscitation strategy with blood products is, is definitely better. Um, paying close attention to the patient's temperature and also trying to um, reverse that metabolic acidosis that they're developing from that shock state. And again, that's really relevant when we think about permissive hypotension in a few moments. There are trauma fat associated factors that we can't really do a huge amount of about, you know, the more they bleed, the more clotting factors they're using. Um, those blood clots that are disrupted from poor manual handling will also consume clotting factors. So getting rapid hemorrhage control and thinking about we how we handle the patients in ED and in theatre is very important. And then there's Interestingly, there's a genetic component to this, um, which we don't fully understand yet. Some patients just bleed worse than others. Um, and of course, comorbidities and um, medica pre-existing medications. And you, you would have heard me speak previously about the European guidance on DOAX and major trauma and um, some hopefully soon to be licensed uh, antidotes for some of the newer DOAX. OK, so just to kind of round off this hemostatic bit, I thought it would be nice just to mention some of the trials that have recently been published or are about to launch. So many of you will have heard of refill. This is the kind of pre-hospital saline versus blood product trial, the results of which were um, interesting, uh, to say the least. So it was multi-centre, lots of air ambulances. Air ambulances love their acronyms, so here they are. Um, and it was a kind of a random um allocation concealment, concealment, concealment trial and what that essentially meant was you arrived on scene you opened the box and you didn't know if it was going to be blood products or lyoplas versus saline in the box itself they had a composite outcome um, so combining mortality and lactate clearance and they did that because the incidence of these cases is rare and to achieve their required power calculation was going to take them decades if they didn't have a composite outcome. Um, interestingly, they were also looking for a 10% reduction in mortality. Now, there's very few things we do in medicine which give you such a huge outcome benefit. And I think that, you know, in retrospect, that was ambitious. But, you know, it's a careful balance between um, funding for trials, um, how free, you know, what the instance of an outcome measure is going to be and how long you're going to run the trial for. Keeping in mind this trial was running for six or seven years anyway. And unfortunately, it didn't quite meet their um, pre-calculated uh, recruitment. But keep in mind, the trial was stopped for nearly a year because of COVID. So it's amazing that they managed to get as far as they did. In terms of outcomes, uh, I've kind of alluded to this, there was no significant outcome in mortality, nor was there a significant difference in uh, coagulopathy or uh, death within the first three hours. What was interesting was that there was a higher baseline haemoglobin and total amount of blood products given to the patients who did have pre-hospital blood products administered. And I guess, well, certainly the haemoglobin makes sense, but I guess that kind of makes sense about arriving in ED uh, and as a receiving team, seeing a patient have a blood transfusion. I guess that is going to subconsciously push the, push the hospital team down the, the pathway of giving more blood products. Um, so that's something to consider as well. Um, this trial was an amazing achievement. You know, to be able to undertake this pre was was pretty incredible. Um, there are some some big limitations from my perspective, uh, and there's some great podcasts out there that summarise these better than I can. Um, things that I'd like to just bring to your attention. Uh, lactate clearance as an outcome measure, I think uh, we need to be cautious with. Uh, we know that lactate increases for lots of different reasons, and using that as a sole marker of whether or not resuscitation is sufficient probably isn't. Um, what most of us do at the moment. Uh, the trial was underpowered, um, but for reasons that were totally out of the control of the research team. There were fairly short distances for transfer, um, and the amount of blood products given to the intervention group was relatively low. And you could argue that the patients included in the trial, the majority of them perhaps weren't bleeding as aggressively as the teams thought they were. And it's got us to rethink a little bit about how we recognise trauma shock and to start thinking a little bit more about those bleeding mimics. The take home for me from this trial is that if you want to give a little bit of crystalloids to a patient 
let's say you're not entirely sure if they're bleeding, if they've got a bleeding mimic, that's probably not a bad thing. And I think the trials, the trial results would support that that's not harmful in that context. So for me, I think that's really helpful. OK, prior stats, I'm not going to go into this because um, the trial is closed, results are pending. Um, it, it's the trial that's looking at early cryoprecipitate in major trauma. The, the hypothesis being uh, fibrinogen is what these patients need quite early on in their resuscitation profile. So I'll, I'll distribute those results um, maybe in an m, &M format uh, in the near future. OK, so the SWIFT trial. So let's talk a little bit about whole blood because this is coming and it's coming soon. Um, there are pre-hospital challenges with carrying balanced uh, components, so FFP, blood cells and platelets. Uh, we, we don't carry platelets um, for obvious reasons. There's weight issues, the cold chain uh, challenges, there's cost associated. And the thought is that uh, whole blood or a combination of red cell and plasma combined, which is what this diagram here on the right is, uh, might mitigate some of these issues. In addition, uh, the time to transfusion and the effects on uh, ongoing coagulopathy might be improved. So uh, London did a uh, red cell and plasma trial, which is a feasibility trial to prove to NHS BT that this was a feasible study to undertake. And subsequent to that, the SWIFT study, so study for whole blood and frontline trauma, is about to launch. And it's entirely possible that patients being brought to QMC may have been recruited into this trial. So let's move on to the second component of damage control resuscitation, which is permissive hypotension. There are two principles that we need to understand to um, fully appreciate what the purpose of permissive hypotension is. The first is just the recognition of what a shock state is. Um, the definition of which we're all very familiar from our uh, uh, postgraduate training. So the failure of the circulatory system leading to inadequate organ perfusion and tissue oxygenation. But just as importantly, we need to recognise that the main cause of preventable, de preventable death in major trauma is non-compressible torso hemorrhage. So bleeding um, from an arterial source in the thorax or abdomen. And it's these two principles which underline what permissive hypotension is all about. So trying to maintain essential organ perfusion with a, an appropriate mean arterial pressure um, whilst avoiding clot disruption until you get definitive hemorrhage control. So just keep that in your mind as we then go through the next few slides. It's controversial, uh, I think, in my opinion, for a few different reasons. A lot of the studies that this is built upon um, in the animal military model, I don't think are comparable to civilian trauma practice. So I'm going to show you some of the civilian papers shortly. Uh, many of those papers don't think about traumatic brain injury, and we know how bad hypotension is in a brain injured patient. And keep in mind what we've just been discussing about coagulopathy and how that may also be driven by poor microcirculatory flow. And maybe we're making patients more coagulopathic by allowing them to be hypotensive for longer. And that has an impact on our morbidity and mortality as well. What's tricky is that international guidance uh, is pretty vague um, and a little bit confusing when you start to think about things like brain injuries. So if you look at the nice major trauma guidance, they advocate resuscitating a patient with non-compressible hemorrhage to a palpable central pulse. Now, in a lot of young patients, that's going to be a systolic in the 50s and 60s, and that's pretty brave um, and tricky to do because you're kind of walking that line between low flow output uh, cardiac arrest states. They do advocate being less restrictive if they have traumatic brain injury, but they're not more specific than that. They don't give you specific numbers or targets, which is probably OK because every patient's different when you consider their comorbidities. The European guidance is a bit more specific. It's advocating systolics of 80 to 90, but that is for everybody. That's for all ages, all trauma, penetrating, blunt. And I guess the point I'm going to be making in a few moments is that I think we, we need a much more nuanced approach to our resuscitation strategies. There's a fantastic editorial by Matthew Wells in Anesthesia a few years ago, um, which I've mentioned uh, previously. It's titled Stop the Clot or Drain the Brain. Um, oh, sorry, Pop the Clot or Drain the Brain. And I really advocate going to read, this, read that editorial. And the next few slides are based around the content of that, that paper. So we're going to go through uh, four or five 
uh, historic studies, that were the basis on which permissive, civilian permissive hypertension is built. And then we're going to finish off looking at the uh, Cochrane uh, review meta-analysis. So bear with me, papers to go through, but I'll be brief to bring us to the conclusion. So Bickel uh, et al, this is probably the cornerstone paper back in the 90s. Um, they were all young men predominantly, and they all had penetrating trauma. They had to be hypertensive for inclusion, and it was delayed versus immediate crystalloid resuscitation, so no blood products involved at all. There was a survival benefit. Now, this is the only human civilian study within the Cochrane Review meta-analysis that showed a benefit for permissive hypotension, which is amazing considering we do this for lots of different patients in modern uh, trauma care across the country and the world. Weaknesses of the paper, penetrating trauma in a single centre study. Turner et al, not me, thankfully, I'm not that old, uh, in the late 90s, uh, much less penetrating, so mostly bunch trauma, so that's great, and actually a much wider range of ages, which is, again is fantastic. So that's probably a bit more representative of the major trauma cases that we'd expect in the Midlands, certainly. Um, their definition of major trauma was pretty loose. It was basically if they went to ITU, uh, how long they stayed in the hospital and if they died. So there was no injury severity scoring. This is pre-Tarn days. Um, they did include traumatic brain injuries, which is great. They didn't show a mortality benefit. Um, they also had a pretty poor compliance with study protocols and randomization was a bit more weak as well. So other limitations to the study. Dutton et al, uh, Journal of Trauma Care, again, late 90s, um, mostly penetrating trauma, young patients, excluding brain injured patients. And as, again, as before, no survival benefit with delayed crystalloid or red cell resuscitation. Another paper, and again, just repeating the same message, really. So this is a bit later, so 2012 to 2013, a high proportion of penetrating trauma, keeping in mind that uh, I think in the UK, 3% of a major trauma is penetrating. Um, mean age of 42, that's a bit better, it's certainly better than the 20s and 30s in the previous studies. Um, they did exclude brain injured patients, which is important because we want to know what to do with them. Um, and again, although uh, there seems to be a difference, the confidence interval crosses one. Uh, not uh, other weaknesses, not powerful mortality outcomes. And it goes on and it goes on and the scope goes on. Um, essentially, most of these studies didn't show um, mortality benefit with permissive hypertension or delayed volume resuscitation, which feeds us nicely onto the summary for all of that. So a Cochrane review meta-analysis in 2014, their summary from this meta-analysis was there is no evidence for or against the use of early or large volume intravenous fluid administration in uncontrolled hemorrhage. And I think that's really important when we consider that actually this is in some places in the country and across the world, this has become a standard of care for all major trauma patients. They highlight some of the limitations which we've just discussed. So blunt multi-system polytrauma is probably the, well, is definitely the predominant type of trauma that we see in the UK. Um, and certainly here in the Midlands, with penetrating trauma being a much smaller proportion. Now, most of the studies that we've just talked about and included in this meta-analysis, um, the civilian studies are predominantly penetrating trauma. Um, we give blood and FFP now. Again, all these studies were about crystalloids. Um, there's a high incidence of traumatic brain injury because most of our patients are blunt polytraumatically injured patients. So again, you know, we need studies that include that cohort if we want transferable data and outcomes. Um, and the average age of our trauma population is increasing. So relying on studies that are built around patients in their 20s and 30s, again, has significant limitations. So just to bring this all to a conclusion, you know, what am I trying to say from all of this? Well, I think that hypotension, like actual hypotension, so you've got an arterial line in and the patient is truly hypotensive. Um, we need to recognise that as that's a decompensation of the bleeding trauma patient, okay, and often requires immediate blood product resuscitation to maintain that essential end organ cerebral uh, coronary perfusion. And we need 
to have a much more nuanced and individualized approach to the way we resuscitate these patients. We need to think about the patient factors. So how old are they? What are their comorbidities? You know, a 50 year old on three different antihypertensives is different to a 65 year old who runs marathons. What about the injuries themselves? Well, yes, penetrating thoracic or abdominal trauma probably does warrant a period of permissive hypotension. I think the evidence would support that. But a patient with multi-system blunt polytrauma probably doesn't. And also think about what they're bleeding from. You know, that blunt polytrauma patient is much less likely to have an isolated arterial pathology. They're much more likely to be bleeding from bones, venous plexus, uh, solid organs, and your systolic blood pressure is kind of irrelevant in that context because that's not going to push a clot off from a bone or a venous plexus. So think about what the injuries are and what you think the patient's bleeding from. And what's really important as well is to consider time from injury. Most of the patients we see in hospital are 45 minutes to an hour after their point of injury. They've been hypotensive for nearly an hour already. So by the time we get them, we probably need to be filling them back up to near euvolemia if we want to mitigate that morbidity that they're developing from their end organ ischemia. And maybe this permissive hypotensive stuff is more of a pre-hospital context rather than a hospital resuscitation context. This slide is just taken from uh, one of the um, pre-hospital SOPs to do with resuscitation targets. I'd ignore all the numbers because they're totally arbitrary when you consider patients can range from you know zero to 100. I've highlighted verbal contact though because I don't want anyone leaving today thinking that we shouldn't do permissive hypotension for anybody. That young patient who has incisional trauma to the thorax and abdomen, who is talking to you in recess, they're compensated, leave them be. Get good access, have volume ready to go. But as soon as they become confused and that they've decompensated the cerebral perfusion, that's the point to intervene with volume. OK, because I do think that actually aggressively volume resuscitating patients with incisional trauma in the thorax and abdomen when they don't need it might cause harm. OK, so permissive hypertension in the right context is the right thing to do. So it's all a bit confusing uh, and I just wanted to kind of bring it to a close by talking about what we can definitely agree on. I hope we can agree on um, and going forward. So the, that lethal triangle that we've all learned about, we probably need to expand that a little bit to start thinking about lethal diamond stuff. You know, it's a bit uh, it's a bit gimmicky, but the point I'm trying to make, I guess, is these patients get hyperkalemic quickly. Give them calcium because the, you'll collate that out with the red cells we're giving. Um, Avoid crystalloids and keep them warm. OK, and I think, you know, as an ethicist, we're fantastic at doing all these things. Um, really think carefully about manual handling. So we've got these trauma matches in the ED now, which are fantastic for keeping the patients nice and warm and comfortable. But it's the little things uh, like when you go to scan, you don't have to do, you know, run to scan and, you know, go around corners generating three G's of force, you know, nice and gently, don't bang into door frames, transfer them onto the CT table and back off again, really slowly and gently, because some of these patients will have unstable clots sitting on vascular beds and we can dislodge those if we're not careful. Um, get hemorrhage control early. We're great at putting binders on and putting tourniquets on bleeding limbs, but even things like big scalp lacerations, put some sutures in an ED before you go to scan, because a scan certainly here at the NUH at the moment takes, you know, up, up of 30 minutes to do, and you can bleed a significant volume from a fairly innocuous looking scalp wound in a scan for 30 minutes. Uh, give TXA, and as I said before, balance blood product resuscitation. Now, I do... Uh, I do apologise. I have shown you this before and it's on my to do list to try and um, get this through theatres and anaesthesia governance. This is a nice little uh, aid memoir which I've stolen from another major trauma centre, which kind of summarises a lot of these concepts quite nicely. And I think this might be helpful to have available in our emergency theatres just as a, a point of reference um, for one of the teams to make sure that we're covering off everything because, you know, we all forget stuff in, in stressful situations. The final two slides are about damage control surgery. Uh, and again, you'll all be very familiar with this, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of important points. There are four main things that we're trying to achieve when we bring our unstable major trauma patients to theatre. And having a 
having situational awareness of them as the anaesthetist is really important because our surgical colleagues will understandably get quite task focused on the surgery they're trying to perform and having an awareness of what we're trying to achieve um, from an anaesthetic perspective will allow us to kind of maintain that situational awareness. So the first thing is uh, hemorrhage control, which is pretty obvious, right? You know, binders, tourniquets, uh, take them to IR if they have an IR amenable lesion and the patient isn't peri-arrest. Um, otherwise, go to theatre for surgical hemostasis. Uh, fracture stabilisation, so X fixing rather than definitive uh, fixation. Decontamination, so any perforated viscous needs uh, defunctioning and washing out of the abdomen. Um, and de don't forget about decompression, so uh, skull or thorax that needs to be decompressed. And that's all we're trying to achieve with our damage control surgery. We're just trying to get the patient to a point where they're now resuscitatable for intensive care to work their magic so that in 24 to 48 hours we can come back for some definitive surgical management. The new ED anaesthetic charts have been developed with this concept in mind. Um, you'll only find them in ED. And I know that it's a bit frustrating when you go down to pre op a patient for a non trauma related thing that you've got to bring a chart with you. But it, it didn't make any sense for us to have two different anaesthetic charts in ED because that just that wouldn't have worked. These charts have been designed to slim down. They're easier to use for sedations in ED, for the um, RSIs, for the patients who have a head scan and get woken up. Um, there's a slim down kind of sign in time out section from a WHU checklist perspective for those super sick red trauma calls that come to theatre. And they have these timeouts built into the chart just to prompt the anaesthetic and surgical team just to have a little moment to talk about three things. What's the patient's physiology doing? So what's the acid base and temperature looking like? How much blood have we lost and given? And where are we with the surgical plan, keeping in mind those four principles of damage control resuscitation? So we're avoiding trying to do definitive surgery unless the patient is physiologically normal and you've got immediate hemorrhage control and they're looking pretty good. So that's everything I wanted to talk about. Thank you very much. Um, I'll make sure these references are available to anybody who wants them. And, and I would I would advocate reading that editorial by uh, Matt Wiles. It's, it's excellent. It summarises that evidence much better than I ever could.